As, uh, as Stan mentioned, I was here I think, two months ago preaching uh, on the resurrection. Uh, tonight is the crucifixion, so it feels a bit like a, a backwards journey through the, the life of Jesus. Um, so I guess I'll see you at Christmas next time. Uh, the passage is there, helpfully, in the, the service sheets for you if you'd like to follow along as I speak. And before I do so, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for this chance to come before your word this evening. Thank you that the words here are inspired for our benefit and for our edification. And Lord, we pray that in these next few minutes as we consider this passage, that you'll be with me as I speak, making my words clear and helpful and opening all of our hearts to the truths of your gospel. And Father, we pray these things, trusting in your strong name. Amen. Well, if you've seen any of the, uh, the posters for First Wednesday around Ealing in the last few weeks, in fact, I think there was one up there earlier on, uh, you'll know that the, the passage uh, tonight uh, is, is Luke 23. The sermon title is Too Bad for God? Question mark. That's really the question we're trying to answer this evening. Is it possible to be too bad for God? Are any of us here uh, too bad for God? That's, I'm sure you're aware, a very personal question to, to ask. Maybe it makes you feel slightly uncomfortable to be asked that question right at the start of the sermon. I'm sure that there are probably people here this evening who, perhaps for years, have carried around with them a sense of overbearing guilt. Maybe there's been something in the past, something you may have said or done, which for years you've, you've felt guilty about, you've felt that it's, it's always kind of put you off limits when it comes to Christianity. Or maybe it's just an ongoing sense of of unworthiness. You feel like you're consistently falling short of what you think a good life should look like. Never mind what God thinks of what a good life should look like. And for that reason, you you feel like you're off limits when it comes to Christianity. Why on earth would Jesus want someone like you to be a part of his people, you might think? Won't he just uh, tell you to, uh, to clear off that you're not good enough, you're too bad for God? You've made too many mistakes, you're you're not worthy of a part of his kingdom, and you don't have the time to make recompense for all these mistakes in life. And so you're in this vicious circle, you feel dejected about yourself, and you feel rejected by God or by religion. Well, if that's the position that any of us tonight are feeling in, and many people do feel in that way, that, that sense of overbearing guilt... Uh, then first of all, let me thank you for coming along tonight. We really do appreciate that. Thank you for giving us the chance uh, to speak to you about the Christian message. But secondly, let me also say that as Christians, uh, we're supremely confident in Jesus. We're confident in his message, that it is good news, powerfully good news, for even the most desperate sinner. And we're delighted that tonight there's a chance uh, to share that news with you. We're looking at this story which Sally read to us, the passage tonight is, is very simple and very short. It's simple because the, the gospel is a simple message. And it's short because Man United are playing Bayern Munich. And maybe some of you want to see uh, the second half of that. Well, the passage there that's, that we're going to look at this evening is, is one which is going to be helpful for all of us to look at. Uh, but I've chosen it particularly for those who feel that perhaps uh, we're beyond the pale. That our guilt means that we're feeling that we can't approach God, that we feel that we're too bad for God. And the story takes place, as you'll have noticed, in those last few moments of Jesus' life as he's dying on the cross. Luke sets the scene and he says that two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So here we have Jesus, he's taken to the cross to be crucified, and either side of him there are two criminals. That's all the information actually that Luke gives us about these two characters, he just describes them as criminals. So we have no idea why they're there, we don't know what they've done to deserve crucifixion. But we do know that crucifixion was reserved by the Romans for the worst of offenders, usually those who've committed some kind of crime against the state. And crucifixion really was an awful way to die, the most hideous form of execution ever devised by man. It was deliberately drawn out, deliberately barbaric, uh, deliberately gruesome, in order to convince people that rebelling against the Romans really wasn't worth the risk. 
Listen to how uh, Roman historian Cicero describes crucifixion. He says, The executioner, the veil that covers the condemned man's head, the cross of crucifixion, these are horrors which ought to be far removed not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts and gaze and hearing. It is utterly wrong that a Roman citizen, a free man, would ever be compelled to endure or tolerate such dreadful things. So make no mistake, crucifixion really was a terrible, terrible way to die. Excruciatingly painful. And so we know that the two people either side of Jesus must have done something dreadful to deserve that punishment. In contrast, as we know, Jesus had done nothing wrong. He's there because he's been condemned by a corrupt trial, which ironically found him innocent twice. And he's been sent there because of devious political motives of other people. But those either side of him really do deserve what they're getting. They're not the kind of people you want to meet in a a dark alley. Let's put it that way. So when we think of these two characters, these two criminals either side of Jesus, think think murderer and rapist or or terrorist and paedophile. They're they're that kind of person. Now, it tells us something of the amazing impact that the life of Jesus had had on the area, that the crowd surrounding the cross as he's crucified are enthralled by his death rather than the death of these two terrible characters. Essentially, Jesus really was a, a celebrity at this point. People followed him round. They hung on his every word. They watched him perform miracles. If he was around today, the paparazzi would follow him. He had that kind of status in society. But then imagine the the crescendo of interest in Jesus when it's announced that he's been arrested, he's been put on trial, and then he's been sentenced to death by crucifixion of all things. Suddenly that was the only thing worth talking about. People were were amazed by the fact that this, this great person, Jesus, who seemed to have divine power at his fingertips was about to be put to death in such a a terrible way. But then the amazing thing was that with with only just a handful of exceptions, at this point everybody turned against Jesus. A few days beforehand on what we now call Palm Sunday, the crowds of Jerusalem had welcomed Jesus. They'd hailed him as their Messiah, the, the king that God was to send to his people. But now, in these hours leading up to the crucifixion, public opinion has swayed dramatically against Jesus. People started baying for his blood and crying out for him to be crucified. And Luke gives us just a taste of some of the attitudes that were evidenced at that time. He says that some people cast lots to see who would get to keep his clothes. So these people seem just remarkably indifferent to the plight of Jesus. Now, the only thing that they're concerned with is who gets to, to get a share of the spoils after he's died. Other people are described as stood by watching. So they're, they're intrigued by the sight of this crucifixion. But the way that Luke describes it, it, it sounds like they, they have no feeling towards Jesus. They have no pity towards him. Now, these people are probably the very same people who had been in the crowds listening to Jesus teach, watching him perform miracles. And yet now, they, they're just there to be entertained by him. It seems like they, they view Jesus as someone who can just keep their interest, entertain them by either a miracle or a crucifixion, as, as is now the case. They have no personal commitment to Jesus. They're indifferent to his plight. And then Luke describes some rulers who are stood nearby. The people who are watching are, are indifferent. The rulers on the other hand, are filled with this animosity towards Jesus. They scoff at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. So they throw all of Jesus' claims back in his face. For these past three years, Jesus has been preaching, he's been saying that he is the Christ, the the king that God has sent to his people, saying that he's come to save people. Now this, as you might well imagine, has has angered the ruling authorities. They saw these claims of Jesus as 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 a rebellion against those in power currently. They thought that he was trying to stir up some kind of rebellion. And they became became jealous of his popularity. And here on the cross, as Jesus is dying, it seems like all of these claims of his that he's made, 
are suddenly falling apart. He can't even save himself, never mind anyone else, they say. And so the rulers are delighted with this. This is what they wanted to see all along. Finally, this great rival of theirs is is having his comeuppance. And the rulers are stood there enjoying rubbing it in. And then next, Luke tells us that some of the soldiers join in with this mocking. They offer Jesus sour wine to drink and they say to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also a sign attached to the cross which simply read, This is the king of the Jews. And then in verse 39, Luke changes the the camera angle. He he points it away from the crowds around the cross and he points it towards those three individuals being crucified. And the rest of the passage really is spent looking at these three different individuals. The first criminal, Jesus, Jesus and the second criminal. And we see three very different responses from these three, from these three people. First of all, the first criminal speaks. And he says to Jesus, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. It's a, a desperate and an angry plea to Jesus. He's implying, ironically, that Jesus isn't doing all that he could to save guilty people. Now this man, as we've seen, is a is a deplorable criminal. He spent his whole life putting himself first and trying to avoid justice. And even now on the cross, on those last few hours of his life, he's doing exactly the same thing. He's putting himself first and trying to avoid justice. His whole life just revolves around him. And so he gets angry when he's called to account. And he he pushes that anger in the direction of Jesus. He's being punished for his sins but his response is to blame Jesus. There's this irrationality to his thinking. He's, he's not thinking clearly. And so he, he starts accusing Jesus, blaming him, criticizing Jesus as Jesus undergoes crucifixion as well. Now we've seen these, these different responses to, to the crucifixion. The rulers, the people, the soldiers, the, the crowds and the, the first criminal. And they've all attacked Jesus in in various different ways, either through their animosity, their mockery, their blaming him, their words and so forth. And yet, do you see, in in all of their attacks against Jesus, there's this, this similar thread to what all of them are saying. Each one of them is effectively saying, Jesus, if you if you really are the Christ, if you really are who you say you are, if you really are the Son of God, why on earth, why on earth are you on a cross? And you see the the, the mindset that they're in. For them, the fact that Jesus is hanging on a cross is proof that he isn't who he says he is. That's their approach to the situation. And the question that we have to ask ourselves this evening is, well, do we agree with these people? When we look at the crucifixion, when we look at the the accounts of it that we have in the Bible, do we see there uh, just simply a, a good man dying young? Do we see all these claims of his being shattered by just a crown of thorns and a handful of nails. Is this proof that we can't believe what Jesus has said about himself? Well, actually, the the exact opposite of that is true. In the the first half of the passage, Luke has mentioned three different examples of fulfilled prophecies. That is, things written in the Old Testament coming true at the crucifixion. First of all, in verse 32, Luke pointed out that Jesus was crucified with criminals. Now, 700 years beforehand, the prophet Isaiah had prophesied that the Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors and assigned a grave with the wicked. A thousand years previously, David had written Psalm 22, this psalm that that describes the anguish of, of God's anointed king, the experience that he's going through. And he wrote, A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet, And they divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. And we see the clear allusions to that in the writing of Luke. And then in verse 36, Luke states that the the soldiers offered Jesus sour wine to drink. And again in the Psalms, we read the words of David in Psalm 69. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Now do you see why Luke is, is including these little details? He's showing to us that even though it appears that on the cross the claims of Jesus are being shattered and falling apart, 
In actual fact, the crucifixion shows us that Jesus really is the Christ because it's the fulfillment of what has been written beforehand. It shows us something of the amazing reliability of the Bible when we see hundreds and even thousands of years beforehand the biblical writers writing down things which were then to come true centuries later in the life of Jesus, even in minute detail, even down to the fact that his hands and his feet were pierced. Now, Luke has pointed out three examples of that. Believe me, we could spend the rest of the night looking at 300 examples of that. These occurrences in the Bible of prophecies about Jesus coming true in very precise detail. So, if that shows us that at the cross, this is the plan of God coming together, not the plan of God falling apart, then the question we should ask is, well, what's this plan going to achieve? Why on earth is Jesus going through this suffering? Why is that part of the plan that God had in store for Jesus? Those around him are heaping insults on Jesus. The crowd is deriding him. His own words have been thrown back in his face. He's being tortured extensively before and during the crucifixion. And what do you think is going through the head of Jesus in the midst of all this suffering, all this this physical and spiritual and verbal torture? Do you think that Jesus is, is angry or resentful or vengeful? Well, actually, verse 34 tells us what's going on in the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What's at the forefront of Jesus' mind as he's being crucified, as he's being mocked by that crowd? Well, put simply, it's it's forgiveness for guilty people. That's what's on the heart of Jesus. That's what the heart of Jesus looks like, even amidst all this, this terrible suffering. The heart of Jesus is one which longs for guilty people to find forgiveness from God the Father. Now, perhaps you're one of those people that I mentioned at the start. You you carry around with you a sense of guilt, and you feel like you're just not good enough for God. You feel like you've fallen too short, and you realize that you, you really don't deserve heaven, like the rest of us. Well, if that's you, then, do you see this this olive branch of hope extended to you by this little prayer of Jesus? Just one sentence. Jesus wants you to find forgiveness. That's what's on his heart as he goes to the cross. Even if you've been the very person who had driven the nails into his hands and his feet. This desire of Jesus for guilty people to be forgiven, for you to be forgiven, wouldn't have abated one bit. That's what Jesus wants. That's what the cross is about. That's the extent of his love towards guilty people. That's the depth of his mercy. Jesus longs that guilty people find the forgiveness from God that they need. So we've seen what the crowd have said, we've seen what the first criminal said, and we've listened now to this prayer of Jesus, seeing his desire for guilty people to find the great forgiveness from God. The only person left in the passage for us to, to look to is the second criminal, now, Luke doesn't give us a, an exhaustive account of the crucifixion. None of the gospel writers do that. What he does do is, is give us a little snapshot, like all the, the gospel writers do, just focusing on different aspects of the story. But if you were to flick to, to Matthew, I think, 26, and if you were to read the account of the crucifixion there, what you'd find is that initially, this second criminal was exactly like the first criminal. To start with, the second criminal was likewise hurling insults at Jesus, criticising him, cursing him. And then somewhere along the lines, and we don't have it recorded, but but somewhere along the lines, miraculously, this second criminal has this this change of heart. And his eyes are are open to the truth. And he he stops being hostile to Jesus. He, He stops hurling insults at him. And he realises that he is guilty and that Jesus is perfect. And the hostility towards Jesus comes to an end. Usually that's what we call repentance, when someone's attitude towards Jesus does this about turn and and it's seen in their behaviour. Look at how he starts to act after his heart has been changed. He, He starts rebuking the first criminal. Initially he was having a go at Jesus and then... Now he's having a go at the the other criminal, saying that he should fear God because he's under the same sentence of condemnation. But unlike Jesus, 
that he actually deserves it. So unlike the first criminal, the second criminal now is seeing things clearly. Even, even though his, his whole life has been a, a mess up to this point, finally he's, he's got it. He's, he's a sinner in the hands of an angry God. A God who is just and so must punish sin eternally. The first criminal is trying to get away from the, ju- the judgment of God. The second criminal isn't making any excuses. He's accepting that he is guilty. He deserves punishment, not only from men, but from God as well. He admits that before Jesus. And he says to the criminal, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now this criminal has come to the life-changing realisation that the way that we live our lives has got eternal significance because we don't simply have to face earthly justice if we get caught doing wrong. But also we all have to face the inevitable and the eternal judgment of God, every one of us. And it's taken him until his last day of life to realise that, but finally he's grasped it. God is a God of justice and he must put his sin. And therefore all of us have something to fear before the judgment throne of God. And he starts to realise his great need for mercy, his great need, his great need for forgiveness from God. And then he also realises that Jesus uniquely is perfect. Jesus has nothing to fear before God's judgment because he's never done anything wrong. He's, he's perfect, which shows that he is who he says he is, that he's the Christ, he's God's anointed king. And so what does the man do with this, this newfound realisation of his own guilt, his own condemnation, and Jesus' divine perfection. Well, he turns to Jesus, and he asks him that when Jesus enters his kingdom, that he remember him. So he sees that Jesus is king. He sees that he's going to have a kingdom. And he simply asks that when Jesus enters that kingdom, that, that he remembers this criminal. He doesn't try and make any excuses for himself. He doesn't try and make out that somehow he deserves his way into heaven. He's not trying to worm out of God's condemnation. He's simply admitting that he's in the wrong and asking for Jesus to remember him. Well, how is Jesus going to respond to that kind of plea? That really is the key question tonight. Many of us can perhaps relate to this second criminal. We know that we've made a mess in certain areas of our lives. We realise that we've fallen short and angered God by our rebellion against him. We realise that he's a just God and and must punish sin. And so we realise our great need for God's mercy, God's forgiveness. And the only turning point is is to turn to Jesus and ask for him to remember remember us. What's Jesus going to do at this point does he tell this man look sorry you're not good enough you've you've made too many mistakes does he say to him it's it's too late now you're about to die you've got no chance to live a better life and and earn your way in from here on in well actually Jesus says none of those things he says to the man truly I say to you today you'll be with me in paradise Jesus promises this man paradise that's the good news that Jesus has to offer every one of us tonight. There is indeed an escape from God's condemnation. And it's found when someone turns to King Jesus and acknowledges himself as unworthy and as guilty and acknowledges him as the spotless, the pure, the righteous king and asks him to remember them in his kingdom. And if someone truly does that, then he will do. It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter... If you're like this criminal that Jesus is speaking to on the cross, who has lived a terrible life and has no chance to make amends, regardless of that, forgiveness is is offered immediately, freely, unconditionally, when a repentant sinner turns to King Jesus and trusts in him. Now maybe you're asking, on, on what basis can Jesus offer this? I've mentioned two or three times this evening that God is a God of justice. He's a God who must punish sin. And so this promise of paradise that Jesus has just made maybe sounds a little glib to you, as if God really isn't that bothered about justice and right and wrong and can just wipe people's slate clean like that. On what basis can Jesus make that offer? 
Well, I think one of the most beautiful things about this story is that at the very moment that the thief turns to Jesus and asks for forgiveness, simultaneously, even though the thief doesn't realize it, simultaneously, Jesus is paying the penalty for this man's sins. Look down for a minute at verse 44. It's in those sheets. Luke says that at the sixth hour, that's noon by the Jewish clock, there was darkness over the whole land for three hours. Now we know that that's not an eclipse because Jesus was crucified at Passover. Passover always coincides with a full moon. Full moons can never coincide with eclipses because of where the earth, sun and moon are. So there's nothing natural about this darkness. And besides, it's, it's three hours, not seven minutes like an eclipse would be. There's nothing natural about it, so there must be something supernatural about this darkness. And the darkness is symbolic of God's judgment falling. And remarkably, God's judgment is falling on Jesus. And then look at the next verse, verse 45. It explains the implication of God's ju- judgment falling on Jesus. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. In Mark's Gospel, we're told it's torn from top to bottom. This curtain in the temple that Luke refers to is, is the curtain that surrounded the most holy place, the dwelling place of God. And it was 80 feet tall, it was three inches thick, and it was a barrier between God and people, because sinful people are not allowed into the presence of God. Now, the only person who could go behind that curtain was the high priest. He could go behind it once a year with the blood of a lamb that he would offer on behalf of the people for their sins, to pay for their transgressions. And yet the curtain always stayed up because the blood of a mere lamb can never pay for the sins of human beings. So the barrier between God and mankind remained there. But then when Jesus died, the curtain is torn in two by God from top to bottom. Now do you see what God is declaring to us through taking down that curtain? He's saying that the blood of Jesus, which is spilt on the cross, the death of Jesus has removed the barrier between us and God, between sinful people and our creator God. If you want, you can read about all of this in in Hebrews 8, 9 and 10, but suffice to say just for now, this means that the way to God is clear for sinful people, people like this penitent thief, people like you and me. We don't need to approach God through a a human high priest because Jesus is our high priest who has appeared before God on our behalf. And we don't need to to try and, and live a good enough life to keep on paying for our past sins because Jesus has paid for our sins once and for all and asks us then to obey him, not in order to earn salvation but to live a life of gratitude for salvation. And we don't need to, to fear any exclusion from God's, promi- for, from God's presence. Because if we've trusted Jesus, then the barrier between God and us has been removed, torn down for good. And that's why Jesus can offer this man paradise. At the cross, Jesus is taking upon himself the real punishment that this man deserves. Jesus is going through hell on earth, literally, on this man's behalf. He's, he's dying so that this sinner can live. He's being forsaken so that he can be accepted. He's being rejected so that this man can be brought near. He's being wounded so that this man can be healed. He's going to hell so that this man can go to heaven. That's what Jesus is doing on the cross. As Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 53, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The criminal doesn't even realise it. He doesn't realise that that's what's going on two yards away from him at the cross next door. But Jesus has already taken the initiative. He's already gone to the, the cross, making the first move, paying for this man's sin and for the sin of all of his people, so that this man, as soon as he turns to Jesus and acknowledges his sin and acknowledges Jesus as king, can be promised paradise. And you know, because of that, this, this man's fortunes are, are miraculously transformed in an instant. To paraphrase what has been said elsewhere, this man, he confessed that he was deserving of crucifixion. And turning to the Saviour, he prayed, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly, truly, 
I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And a few hours later, the gates of heaven flung wide for him. And as it were, hand in hand, he and his saviour entered in. And that morning, he'd been scorned by men. That evening, the angels of God welcomed him. That morning, he was utterly vile. That evening, he was washed in the blood of Jesus and was, was made perfect. That morning, he'd been naked. That evening, he was clothed in white raiment. That morning, he, he stood on the very threshold of hell. And by that evening, he was stood in the assembly of the righteous in heaven itself. That morning, he'd been in the, the clutches of Satan. By that evening, he was safe in the arms of Jesus. And that morning, when he, he opened his eyes in that prison cell, he awoke with the, the fear of death in his stomach. And that night, when he closed his eyes for the last time on the cross, he had the joy of life in his heart. Do you want to know what Easter's about? Do you want to know what Christmas is about? Do you want to know what Jesus is about? This is what it's all about. The vilest offender, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. It's good news, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for the grace in the gospel. Thank you that even for the vilest offender, Jesus has gone to the cross and paid for sins such as these. Lord, we praise you that as Christ died on the cross, that he paid for the sins of all of his people forever and ever, once and for all. And because of his death, there is life for those who turn to him and believe in him. Lord, we want to pray for anyone here tonight who has not done that yet, who hasn't followed the example of the penitent thief of turning to Jesus and confessing sin and acknowledging him as the true king that you have sent to us. And we ask that if that hasn't happened in anyone's heart here this evening, that they would turn to Christ through your grace and receive the promise of paradise. And Lord, we pray those things in Jesus' strong name, our Saviour. Amen.